This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, Andrew Kirsch on Life as a Canadian Spy. That's when I first Googled, does Canada have spies? And, you know, what do they do or how do I become one? Uh, And that was the start of my journey. When I would knock on a door and say, hello, my name is Andrew, I'm here from CSIS, I would just get a blank stare. And I'd have to explain, (laughs) well, CSIS is Canada's domestic intelligence service. We are mandated to do, and, and I had a whole spiel. I did it every single time. I spent a lot of that part of my career going, I can't believe I get to do this. I can't believe I have to do this. If I were to do this as a civilian, it would be illegal and kind of a fun, stressful and, and surreal experience. Andrew Kirsch, welcome to Chatter. It's really nice to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, you are unique in the history of our uh, podcast, which is that we have <laughs> never had uh, a member of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service on the podcast, a former member in your case. Um, <laughs> right. And you are unique in that your new uh, memoir, I Was Never Here, is the first memoir by somebody who is a former intelligence officer with that service. So you are a bit of a, of a path breaker with this, with this story. <laughs> I, I, and I guess a couple ways today, uh, appearing on the pod and <laughs> writing the book. So I blazing a lot of trails. Yeah. Uh, yes. As far as I know, there's never been another memoir from a Canadian intelligence officer about the experience of working for Canada's domestic uh, security service. Right. Uh, American listeners may be somewhat familiar with uh, CSIS. And it's important we should say, because also we're in Washington, it is pronounced CSIS. It is not CSIS, which is a very yes. prominent think tank here in Washington. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's I, CSIS. I think they got the uh, the Twitter handle, too. Oh, did they really? Oh, man. <laughs> um, so American audiences might going to be tempted to think that CSIS is the Canadian analog to the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, or it's sort of like the Canadian version of MI6, the British service. But that's not exactly right. So give us a sense of what is CSIS and, and what are its characteristics and how it operates in Canada? Well, it's a great question. Americans wouldn't be alone if they made uh, if they got confused by that, because I can tell you Canadians also uh, are not very familiar with CSIS and, and what we do and what uh, the mandate is. So, yeah, Canada's uh, Security Intelligence Service is a domestic security service. So in the U.S., you have the CIA, obviously, uh, operating abroad, and the Brits have MI6. But you know, the British also have MI5, which is their domestic security service. Uh, it's like Australia has ASIO and ASIS. And Israel is Mossad and Shabbat. The other, many other uh, countries have two services, a foreign one and a domestic. Now, in Canada, we only have one, which is a domestic. Some people mm. think, oh, we, we must have a foreign one, but be super secret about it. But we're not that good. Uh, we are <laughs> just a domestic service. So uh, we are investigating threats to the security of Canada, terrorism, espionage, sabotage, foreign influence activities, and subversion. But we're doing that largely within Canada with some um, some allowances for, for some work abroad, but mainly doing it locally. So that's kind of the big difference. Um, and as I said, it, it, unfamiliar to uh, to most people. So how does it figure in the Canadian imagination? I mean, are there are, are CSIS operatives, officers portrayed in Canadian films and television? I mean, does it loom the way that, you know, American and British agencies do in, in their respective countries? We don't really. It has been, uh, I think there's been some pretty uh, horrendous uh, TV shows about it, some, some uh, Canadian television shows. But really, you know, most people in Canada, their kind of imagination with law enforcement is the RCMP, right? The, uh, that right. is a kind of... A, that is what we think about. We think about policing and even intelligence largely. But we have this domestic security service that's largely uh, stayed uh, under under the radar. I think to its detriment, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, because we operate in Canada and we are asking Canadians for help, I thought it's important that more people know about uh, one, that we have it what and what the, they do. Uh, but but yeah, we are at a loss as far as the, as far as the cultural relevance of you know, the James Bonds and the Jason Bournes mm-hmm. uh, and you know these great I would say profile uh, that the other intelligence services have. Yeah, and, it's, and I think even when you say like the, the the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, you know, people have the image of like you know the guys in the red uniform and the horses, <laughs> that's right. and, that, and that's probably that's right. fairly far from the truth too. 
Well, you know what? They that is um, look they, they, they're very well known, well recognized across uh, across the world and, and in Canada. If you say you're from the RCMP, uh, people know what that is. Mm. Uh, That's like saying you're from, from the police. FBI. Yeah, yeah, FBI, CIA. Uh, but when I would knock on a door and say hello, my name is Andrew. I'm here from CSIS. I would just get a blank stare, uh, <laughs> and I'd have to explain. <laughs> well, can't CSIS is Canada's domestic secure, you know, intelligence service. We are mandated to do, and, and I had a whole spiel. I did it every single time. Right, and you and you write about this in the book as sort of cold calling and knocking on doors, and I'm just imagining uh, some people being like, huh, oh, that sounds harmless. Come in." Uh, well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure um, what the spam kind of calls that you get are. Uh, uh-huh. Here in Canada, we have the duct cleaners and we have CRA, our tax, where they say, you know, you are <laughs> going to jail unless you, uh, you know, respond to this uh, phone call, um, Brun pay taxes. Well, you know, I was calling people up and saying, Hi, I'm from the Canadian uh, Intelligence Service and I want to meet. And everyone's, well, what, what, you know, scam is this? Who are you really? Don't bother mm-hmm. me. Um, yeah, had had all of those experiences. Yeah, well, the subtitle of your memoir, which is again called "I Was Never Here," is my true Canadian spy story of coffees, code names, and covert operations in the age of terrorism. And I like this because it, it does situate kind of what you did, which was a lot of what your work you did. And principally, the most I think the most exciting stuff you write about in the book is counterterrorism related. But it gives you a sense also of your job swinging from the sort of mundane and the everyday to the high stakes and the secretive, and you kind of. <laughs> You know, you give a really good sense of what it's like to work in this agency, both as sort of the bureaucracy of it, but also the stuff that does feel like more out of a movie. And we'll, we'll kind of get into all of that. But but talk about, you know, when you were growing up, and it, I imagine you never really thought of joining the, the security service. So talk a bit about what you were doing and ultimately what drove you to apply to work at CSIS. Yeah, I, I was like most uh, Canadians. I had no idea that Canada had a domestic intelligence service, what it was called and what it did. I, I, from Toronto, born and raised, I ended up at a university in the U.S. at Brown University, and I was there on 9-11 when obviously the the terror attacks happened um, just a couple states over. And uh, after I graduated, I ended up in London, England, working for a bank. Um, And I was in the U.K. in 2005 when the terrorist attacks happened on July 7th. And so... You know, for people who maybe are younger, don't remember this this time, it really was this I call it the age of terrorism. I'm not sure. I think that is an official um, what we refer to it as. But mm. there were bombs going off. Uh, trains were getting derailed. There were attacks happening in, in major cities. And it felt very uh, real and very close uh, in London. It was just a couple of blocks over. And that's when I really first and I joke about this in the book. That's when I first Googled. Uh, does Canada have spies? And, <laughs> you know, what do they do or how do I become one? Uh, and that was the start of my kind of journey to get into um, the organization. I moved back to Toronto and applied online through the through the website to to become a Canadian intelligence officer. Um, so I, as I said, I did not have much familiarity with it. It was uh, a bit of a call to service. And that was the feeling of the time for a lot of people. I think that's when I get feedback on the book, certainly from people who similarly applied, my colleagues who also applied around the same time and went through it. That's that's what drove a lot of us to to get involved in a variety of, uh, of ways. And that's what I wanted to uh, to do. So I, as I said, I, I had a degree in public policy and I uh, was, uh, you know, reasonably aware of what was going on in the world. But then that's kind of what drove me to to uh, get involved. And, and the book, as you, as you say, kind of chronicles that, well, what happens when you run away and join the circus, right? There, there is a, when you just sign up and go, this sounds like a good idea. And there had never been a previous book about Canadian spies. Um, I, I, I just kept betting myself, oh, now I do this now. And now I'm on this desk. Uh, and this is what that life looks like. So I kind of wrote this book for the for the future me's uh, when they want to run away and, and, and join the circus, uh, they will have a resource that they can look at and go, oh, that's what my like life looks like. You know, that is what this will kind of involve. Right. So they'll they'll have a bit more than a Google search to go by. Yeah, Google search that takes you to a website that takes <laughs> you to a link that says submit your CV here. Um, and, and, and job descriptions that are uh, let's uh, suitably vague. Obviously, right. um, but also the the Americans, uh, British, uh, most of their intelligence services. We talked earlier about 
how they have this, um, maybe it's a romanticized version of what that life looks like. Um, but there is, you know, there's some awareness of it. Um, in Canada, we, we don't have that. And, and the other part is that that romanticized version is okay. Well, I'm in a, I'm in a trunk in the, somewhere in the middle East and I pop out and I solve this, um, foil this terrorist attack and, and then I get back in the trunk or, or whatnot. But there's a mon- there's the mundane involved. There's the bureaucracy. There's the, oh, I didn't get the, the coolest desk and I'm stuck here for, for a little while writing memos and reports. I, I wanted to capture that, not belabor it, because that'd be a pretty boring book. It was just me at my desk writing memos, but that that's also part of an intelligence career. Um, you, you're, you're, you're not all running around... Um, all the time. Right. So so talk a little bit about you you submit your application to this agency which you know so few people know about. Uh, and then how does the recruitment process go? You write about this in the book. It feels not unlike being hired at a fairly traditional company, but tell us a little bit, give us a flavor of what the recruitment process felt like. The recruitment process is long. It is it long involves many stages. So when I went through it, and it's, this may have uh, may have changed, but essentially there's a number of steps where you go in for kind of an informational interview. I went back for what was called at the time a suitability interview, where you'd be uh, quizzed on your knowledge of the organization. And that's you know, talk about that. I almost uh, dropped the ball my my first foot into the office. You know, I had <laughs> studied. Tell that story. Had, that's a fun yeah, story. Yeah. I, I had I had note cards, like stacks of note cards, and I had read. The, they give you this, this CSIS act. They say, you know, learn learn a bit about the organization, and, and here is the act that it was uh, you know, founded the service, and you should know about it. So I read that thing cover to cover. I had notes. I had the French versions. I didn't speak French at the time, but I had memorized all of these things. And I sit down at the desk, and and my first question is more or less, what does CSIS do? What are the four threats that CSIS is mandated to uh, investigate? And I drew a complete blank. Now, this is this is not a secret uh, or a tough question. I mean, this is basically what does the organization do? Like, what do you, you know, what is the reason for it to exist? Uh, what are the threats? And I, I just, I could not, for the life of me, think of that four lines in the three hundred you know, page book that I tried to uh, try to memorize, or the act that I tried to memorize. But, but that's it. The, the, that is a. Uh, thankfully, my my interviewer took pity on me and kind of leaned in. With, Terrorism? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. That terrorism. thing that made me yes. want to join. <laughs> we definitely investigate terrorism, uh, foreign influence activities, espionage and sabotage, and subversion. Yes, that is absolutely what CSIS right. does. And, you know, I kind of relax and go from there. And there are uh, role playing exercises. There's a, a psychological evaluation, a polygraph exam where they, they kind of put you through the paces hooked up to the, the polygraph machine. And I talk about that. That is not a fun experience, um, even if you have nothing to hide. It sounded it, it sounded pretty invasive and, and pretty nerve wracking the way you described well, it. Well, even if and, and I've led uh, maybe this this is part of the, the Canadian side, of me, but I, I've led a pretty normal, uh, quiet existence to that point and, and, and past. But you just start racking your brain going, I must have done something. They're going to be mad at me. Right. You know, what have I what have I done that I that I haven't admitted to? And it's that that feeling of guilt that I haven't shared every possible terrible thing that I've ever done in my life uh, that just got that needle flying across the. Uh, and you could see I could see that needle going, um, going, oh, no, they know they know. And, mm. and not being able to, to call up anything that jaywalking, unpaid parking tickets like I really uh, was trying to go through the mundane uh, about where I you know, aired in my life. Um, so you go through these number of steps and for me, it took yeah, 15, 18 months. It's a long process, a number of times getting, um, called back, make to the next stage, wait for two months, you know, wonder what's going on, trying to call your recruiter. And of course, they're not telling you anything, thinking that everything is a test. Oh, you know, this must be a test. Oh, um, you know, they're waiting for me to do this or, or they found out that, um, it is, it's very nerve wracking. Of course, I got in. They said, "Hey, can you report in a week?" I said, "Well, come on, guys. <laughs> no, uh, no, <laughs> I, need, I need a little more time to pack up my life and uh, and tell everyone I'm <laughs> I'm moving to Ottawa, but can't tell them why." 
And so you you ultimately get the call that you you are going to go and you're going to do this and embark on this career and you know it, it, clearly you you wanted to do it and that really comes across that every time you're tested you're afraid that you're not going to be <laughs> picked for this but and it's something that you really want. So then you get in. What is what does training look like? I mean, we have again to use the American example. We imagine CIA officers going off to the farm uh, right. down near Williamsburg, Virginia, or FBI agents going to Quantico. So what does training look like for CSIS? Well, training is, is, I guess, not like the those types of movies that have been depicted. It's really trying to familiarize yourself with the organization, uh, who does what, you know, this, the, the reporting standards, how we how we record information, how we gather information, who does what. Um, there's obviously some some role playing and getting yourself familiar with being an intelligence officer. I, I should say that in Canada, we have our intelligence officers we would consider spies are really required to do two roles. And one is to be an analyst, which is somebody who kind of sits behind the desk, uh, reads all the reporting and information that, that comes in on a, on a file, on, a, on an investigation, processes that information, tries to identify gaps, and then is work with partners, uh, field investigators on how to uh, collect information to fill that that intelligence gap, you know, and overseeing the file. And then you have the second role, which is the field investigator. And that is the collector or the person who is knocking on doors, uh, going out, being tasked to speak to people, go to companies and you know, recruit sources to, to gather information. So the, the training is really preparing you for both of those roles. What is our kind of analytic uh, process and, and the rigor behind it? And how do we come to the conclusions and, and put these together. And then that, how do you go and recruit a source? And what's mm -hmm. it like to go and, and try to call someone up on the phone and get them to meet you for coffee? Uh, and that is a fun and and you know, can be a, a strange a strange thing. Right. The, in the American system, in the CIA, of course, you know, the analysts are one group of people and the operations mm -hmm. officers are another. Did, did you find it? I mean, it, did it make more sense or did it work better having one person doing both of those roles? That's been a conversation we've been having. And I, I do, it's by nature, people gravitate towards a role. You can have folks who just don't want to be behind the desk. They're great at going out, talking to people. Um, and I should say, knocking a door, when you, you think you know who's behind that door, you, th you think you know you're going to talk to and how it's going to go, but you never really know. And that can be very stressful, obviously. Yeah. Um, I would say, I used to say I, I was never worried about getting hurt. I was always worried about getting caught. Um, <laughs> and I'm operating in Canada and, and you know, we don't carry firearms. But that is a, it's a tough thing. Go try to build rapport quickly with somebody and have them give you sensitive information that they might you know, not share uh, with anybody else and keep your relationship confidential. And that requires pretty specific uh, skills uh, that you need to work on. And the analyst, as I said, is a, a different, probably different set of skills, a, um, and a, a different temperament of person who's drawn to that, to that role, who really wants to get in and is uh, uh, getting the weeds on things and, and, and pull on threads. So yes, not, um, I think it's helpful to have some people who can specialize and who certainly, um, you know, aces in their places to, where, you know, you have people who who are particularly adapted at one area or the other. But the expectation is you, you should be able to do, uh, you should be able to do both. Uh, and we will train you to do both. And you, you might not realize when you get in what you're going to like. Some people think, oh, yeah, I can't wait to go and, you know, can't wait to kick in doors and I'm going to be this. A big time operator and recruit all these sources, and you get out there and go, oh man, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a grind. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a tough. Um, that's tough. I, I don't, I don't mind going to an office, eight, eight to four, or nine to five, and uh, having people hand me work and, and having that be you know, stressful too, but a different time of stress. Yeah, yeah, and you talk a lot about going out and just constantly knocking on doors and trying <laughs> to find sources, and it, and it really is. I mean, it's just kind of it's it's. It becomes almost you know mundane, and not all of those contacts are going to pay off. So it's you have to just keep doing the routine day after day after day, hoping that you know one time it's going to pay off. You're going to develop that source that's going to be useful. Well, that, I, I used to tell my um, my wife who I, I couldn't you know say who I was meeting or what I was talking about or what I was doing, but I'd say that I talk to people, and I try to get people to talk to me. And a 
a good day is when I find somebody with relevant information or access to information and they're willing to tell me it or talk to me. A bad day is if I find somebody who doesn't have information or doesn't want to talk to me, you know, and there's, there's kind of combination of, of those that you're, you're constantly battling with. So yeah, you can have great coffee with someone who's happy to help you, but has zero access to kind of threat related information you're interested in. Um, Or you can be kind of lied to by somebody, you know, you just, you know, that, that they have it, you know, that, um, that it's good um, Intel, but they, they just won't work with you. right? Right. And there's a frustration to that as well. So, and then sometimes you just can't find people, you know, it's knock on doors and nobody's home. And you knock on the wrong door and you go to a different door. Um, so is that, is that challenge to it too, which I think people don't realize um, is, is a real big part of that job. It's just, I say coffees and conversations. I was in the coffees yeah. and conversations business. And constantly trying, and we should say constantly trying to find people who had information about potential acts of terrorism or other, other threats. So you're out there trying to network in communities of people who might be able to give you information and leads for the security mission of the service. Yes, and maybe I should uh, even even re- rewind a bit and say, so So, CSIS, Canada's Security Intelligence Service is mandated to collect information you know, on threats to the security of Canada. So we are collecting, analyzing, retaining, and advising government on the threats to the security of Canada. And those four threats are terrorism, espionage and sabotage, foreign influenced activities, and subversion. Um, the money laundering is not, you know, not there. You think, well, what's in and what's out. And so that is uh, what we are going to talk about. Do you have information on these four threats? And you know, it's not all, I don't want to say it's some bad people or good people, but we're in the communities um, talking to people, say, hey, if you hear anything, you know, if anything strikes you as odd, if you have any concerns, we're the people who look into this. You know, we're the people who are tasked with keeping Canada and Canadians safe. So a lot of it, like I said, was community interviews where you're just kind of introducing yourself to members of the community that might have this type of information. Um, not all necessarily involved in nefarious activities, but uh, would have access to the information of those who are, you know, and then give you some leads to go and, and, and knock on more doors. So that's that's kind of what we're doing. And as I said, the the, the fun part or the strange part of Canada is we're doing that, we're doing that 10 minutes from you know where I grew up. Hmm. Uh, and 50 minutes from where I live, knocking on a door and saying, hello, my name is Andrew, and I'm here from the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, and I need your help. Hmm. And and that's when I get the blank stare. And then I have to say, oh, CSIS, you know, we're uh, not the CIA. This is what we do. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, convince that person on a doorstep or over the phone that I am who I say I am, and I do need their help. And would, would you please have a coffee with me? And were they mostly receptive? I mean, that seems like a fairly straightforward approach. You're very explicit about what it is that you want from them. Did you find most people were willing to sit with you or, or kind of give you a hearing? Yes, a overwhelmingly uh, positive. Once once people kind of understood uh, that they weren't in any trouble, that we were legitimate, that we were a real organization and real people, um, once you got through that, who are you really and why are you here? Um, and what do you want with me? Why, why are you talking to me? Right. Is, is why, why do you think I would know anything about this mm. type of stuff? Like there are kind of questions you got every time and, um, you know, the, the totally fair questions. Right. So I knocked on your door and said, you want to talk? You'd say, what is this about? You know, why are you really here? But once you, once you explain to people, I, I think maybe it's Canadian, maybe it's maybe it's not. But people want to help. Like people overwhelmingly want to help. So if you explain to them why they're allowed to help or, you know, what help they can give, um, give them the, the freedom to help. But this, this idea that this is okay, this is, this is good, um, kind of allowance to help, uh, they, they'll do it. They, they want to do it, right? I think people's nature is to do that. So you kind of have to go through the steps to explain they're not in any trouble, that they don't have to, um, that we're not the police, um, but that, so that information that they have or may have is important and will they might think oh what, what do i know um you know nothing i have is uh, will be helpful i said well let me you know let me judge that why don't we have a conversation and then i will go away and, and, and i piece this together i talk with a lot of people and 
maybe it is. And if it if it is, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't you feel great about being able to help a national security investigation to keep Canada and Canadians safe? And people say, yeah, sure, okay. And, 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 you, and you say that you, know, you had to tell people, reassure them, you know, look, you're not in any, in any trouble. You're not going to get into trouble talking to me. But were there times where you had to knock on the door of someone or approach somebody who you thought, you know, they may not be directly involved in something nefarious, but, you know, they might be tangentially related and potentially could be kind of mixed up in something. And so they're not exactly, you know, innocent uh, of suspicion. And were there times where you had to approach people that you thought maybe this could be a bad guy? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. Look, we we are looking for people with you know, access to threat related information. Right. And you know, people's access can be they can have very close access because they can be involved in those threat related activities. Um, and sometimes it was really a conversation about sussing out. Well, look, how you know, how involved are you? And, you know, would you be willing to talk to me? Um, would you be willing to talk about the other people that you're involved in these activities with. Um, so we have to have those conversations. There, there are people, you know, subjects of investigation that we are looking at, but ultimately we're looking for sources, uh, source of information. So even right. those people who are involved in these activities, if they want to talk, uh, if they're willing to, you know, they make great sources, right? Because they have the, the credibility and the space, um, and so we have to balance that, obviously, you know, you, what these people are doing, uh, what we're asking about. Um, but that is that's part of the, um, the challenge is we we need people with good access and some people with good access have that for a reason. And we have to navigate what what are we willing to share with that person? What are we going to ask of that person? Do we want them to continue to do the things they're doing while we're talking to them? Managing those relationships is part of source handling and recruiting and then and then source handling. So absolutely, there there is, I would sit down from people and say, look, I need to talk to this person. I'm trying to suss out how involved they are in what's going on, what I know is going on, and how willing they are to talk to me about that. But I, I can't give away too much, right? I, I right. can't tell them how much I know because I, I don't know how on side they're going to be. That's... This makes for, sort of for interesting conversations. You, you write a lot about life in the office as well as, you know, out there recruiting sources. And, um, and, and there's some, you know, kind of the very, you know, the mundane back office activity that goes on even in an intelligence agency. And you, there's some really humorous moments. Um, talk a little bit about choosing code names for operations. <laughs> yes. It, it's really, a, yeah, if you were to you put it as a TV show, it's a workplace comedy where just your workplace happens to be uh, an intelligence service. Uh, I've, I said my office was, was say Brooklyn nine, nine, but it was, uh, you know, we were good people trying to do our best often thrust into ridiculous situations. So for part of my career, in the early part of my career, I was in our kind of human source policy uh, compliance department. We talked just coming through a conversation about, all the challenges for recruiting and, and managing human sources, there is a policy compliance kind of branch that makes sure the, the field investigators are, are acting appropriately and following the rules and the policies and guidelines that, that govern what you're allowed to do and not do. And it, it is as being a compliance policy compliance officer for CSIS is um, no more sexy than probably being a po policy compliance officer for, for anywhere else. I mean, it is a office job reading reports and writing memos. But the highlight of the two years I spent doing that was picking code names for human sources and operations. And that is just as fun as it sounds. So the way it worked is, uh, you know, we would, people would recruit a, a human source and you, everyone gets kind of a code name, uh, an operation to get code names. You need a lot of code names. And we would get to select code names, but ultimately there were a number of rules that they had to kind of be bound by to make them code names that we could use. And, and there was a, a whole other team that would kind of give the thumbs up or thumbs down if they met all, I, I to this day, I, I don't even know all that. There was a big long list of rules and I would submit some that I said, well, why was that denied? But that it couldn't be such a, such a, a noun, like I think I say in the book tree, you know, you couldn't code name tree and that just gets confusing if you're writing reports and tree hid behind the tree and, you know, was over by the tree would, 
would not be a very good operational report. <laughs> so, you, you know, there were there were there were rules about what could be a code name. But so we'd sit around and we would joke about what were uh, popular movies of the day. As I said, every every Top Gun call sign from the original Top Gun at some point was probably requested to be uh, a source name, a Maverick, a Goose, uh, whatever. I don't know how many made it in or didn't. And, and since I've left, I have to believe that they've tried every Avenger under the sun. I don't right. even know all the Avengers names, but there, there may be a Thor out there. There may be a, I don't think Hulk would have passed, but um, you know, to code name sources. And, and in my day, it was, as we tried uh, Anchorman, Burgundy. Uh, we tried some <laughs> some Will Ferrell and Judd Apatow comedies to try to sneak some names through. And my hope was they were obscure enough at secret management that might not be up on their latest Adam Sandler movies. Right. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't recognize that this was a, a cheeky code name that we working level people stuck in the office would all giggle every time we saw it in a report. Uh, not to make us sound immature, but you know wh- when you're when you're stuck in an office and, and this is the highlight, you, you take great pride in it. So we would. Uh, yeah, little little pleasures, uh, little administrative pleasures was naming sources, and of course, once you named a source, that was like, I hope they did great things. I hope they found all the the great information. It, it didn't always work out, but and you would see them to pop up in reports too, right? And say, ah, oh, that's the source that I named. That's my <laughs> that's that's my source. Yeah, it, it really is to to give sources some comfort. I, I didn't know real names. I didn't know. Mm-hmm what they looked like. And I would read these reports and, and do my policy compliance. And, and I was just going off of, it's, it's pretty strict about who has access to all this information, which is why we use things like code names, which is to um, give people anonymity and make sure that it was a very small circle of people who, who knew their identities. So yeah, I would know, I, I would have these these names, and I'd see them pop up, but I, I wouldn't know who the actual person was. So I was rooting for, you know, Rooting for Burgundy to do great. Hey, Burgundy, yeah, right. not someone who got didn't get approved. Oh, Burgundy, good, good, good report, Burgundy. You know, uh, I see you're doing great things. One of the the strange delights when the Edward Snowden files or when Edward Snowden disclosed a lot of the NSA files was seeing some of the names that have been <laughs> applied to NSA surveillance operations. And the one that I remember that sticks out the most was egotistical giraffe. Oh, uh, yeah, and I have amazing. no idea how <laughs> this was chosen. I've heard various. Stories from, you know, it's a it's a random computer generation to it's, you know, some administrative person who's been in an office for 30 years and that's what she does. You know, I've heard stories yes. about pseudonyms and aliases pulled out of a British phone book of, you know, Greater London from 1962. But uh, I loved your story just because it's like, no, it's just us sitting around seeing what we well, can get away with. <laughs> that's right. That's right. There, there definitely was. If we did not give them names, they would send us names. They'd say, how's I this? See. How's that? How's this? But we like, no, let's be proactive. Let's see if we can get a couple in there uh, for sure. So that ultimately, obviously, is why you have to be selective because you can't have, um, you know, source uh, fabricator or a liar, you know, as a, well, I wonder why our source liar got into trouble. You know, you'd have, you'd have to, uh, you wouldn't want names where if they, if they did get out, it looked like you saw this one coming. Well, like Curveball, as you write in the book, who was the famous source who misled the United States pretty significantly on WMD in Iraq. Well, well that's it, right? So the, they, they named this source. And I did wonder when I saw that. So the source, source Curveball, I thought, oh, did, did, was some analyst sitting their desk going, this isn't going to go well. And that yeah. was their cheeky. Right, um, right. When, when it comes out that this person wasn't throwing it right over the plate that uh, they were throwing curveballs uh, you know, are they going to have a self-satisfied chuckle? But um, no, I, as I said, I don't know how other, other people do it. Uh, there are many ways, but that's what we tried to do to, to kill a Friday afternoon and, and have some yeah. fun. So a lot about what you write about in the book is this way that, you know, th- that the service, of course, has to protect secrecy of its sources, of its operations, and that's all understandable. And you have to exercise some level of that in your own life. So what did you tell your family when you were recruited? And, and how much could you let people who were close to you know about where you worked and, and what you did? I, I talk about this a lot in the book because it was something that I struggled with really the most with, and we are not a clandestine service. Now we have, um, we have aliases. I, I, I don't tell anybody, not everybody, my real name. I was able to keep some of, some of that anonymity for everybody's safety and security, right? Not just for myself, but for the people that, that we were talking to, to, to maintain their, their confidentiality. But for the most part, I'm, I'm knocking on a door 15 minutes from where I live, 20 minutes from where I grew up. And I'm saying, hello, 
My name is my name is Andrew. I'm here from the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. I'm investigating threats, including terrorism, and I need your help. And I'm showing them a badge with my organization on it, and I'm standing there right in front of them and asking them, telling what I what I do and I'm interested in. And at night, I'm going on a first date or I'm seeing friends and I'm lying to all of them about what I do, where I work, what I got up to that day. And it is a strange existence uh, that I don't think it needs to be that, that strange, to be honest. We were trying to build these relationships of trust, um, rapport with complete strangers, while at the same time I was isolated from my actual network of friends and supporters and people I probably should have and could have asked for for assistance, thinking, oh, no, I can't tell them. I can't tell them I'm a spy. I'm going to tell this complete stranger I'm a spy, um, but I'm not going to tell this this person I'm going on a date with or or that person I've known since uh, since high school it is it is very odd and I so said that that created challenges and it was always very stressful to figure out when am I going to tell this person what do I tell them and what and what do I ask them to say to other people because ultimately the challenge that I had or, or a big challenge is when when you tell someone when I told somebody where I worked and what I did I was then asking that person to lie for me, which I knew how stressful that was. I didn't want to put that on other people, right? I, I, my brothers would say, you know, what do we, what do we tell people? And say, ah, don't, you know, just make something up. And they'd say, well, that's, you know, that's not a great answer, man. Uh, mm-hmm. Just say, say I work for the government and change the conversation. That's what I do. And that's, you know, a little, little unfair to do. So that was something that I had to, you know, navigate. And I, and I wish I'd done a, a kind of better job with because as i said ultimately we're you know we're not wasn't clandestine i was working as a member of csis uh, trying to maintain some discretion I, the word we constantly use was discretion you know, being discreet i did want to limit the number of people who knew so that if i was out having a coffee and someone looked at me that you know the person that i was having coffee with um you know and everyone knew where i worked and that who i was talking to was talking to somebody from csis but that that is and was a, a big challenge of the job, especially working close to home, right? And being a domestic security service, people would run in. You know, I, actually, I, I said one story where I you know, ran into a friend while I was working operationally. But I, I've had friends who ran into their you know, subject investigation in bars. Like, well, they were out with friends and their person is at the next table and that they're like, why are you following me? And my, I'm just out for a drink with my friends. This is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on the you. No, I just, you know, so they'd have to leave and every, it would get weird. And Ottawa's a small town. Toronto is, is bigger, but still a small town. Uh, that, that kind of funny stuff can happen. Yeah. It, it, it is such a, a strikingly different experience from, you know, what I'm familiar with, with people, you know, for instance, when they're applying for working at the CIA, you're not even really supposed to tell anyone that you're applying there. Or, you know, members of MI6 are, are technically not avowed uh, unless you're the chief. So it's a very different culture that you're operating in where I think that, that word you use, discretion, is so interesting. And it seemed like a lot of the decision making about how much to tell people and who to tell and when to tell them about your professional life was more or less left up to you. Yeah, uh, short answer. There was a lot of a lot of discretion. I had my own uh, challenges, and people handled different ways. I was, um, I think, it leave to, to people in their unique kind of circumstances of who they're friends with and what communities they're a part of and what their communities they're working. I think discretion is. Yeah, I, I, I probably mentioned that word mm. more than, than many others in the book. That's what I was, my operating principle was discretion. And who who am I telling? How do I um, make make my life a little easier, make their lives a little easier while still not lying to everybody mm. that I know? Even, even with sources, I would be talking to people um, and, you know, like when you're trying to build those relationships of trust, with somebody and they ask, "Oh, are you married?" Uh, yeah, or I'm dating, or you, you, you know, you just, it kind of goes both ways, right? The, we're, uh, I would, I would try to be you know, practice discretion, but 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 be open and and have these kind of relationships with with both people. And it was also navigating that life on the other side was how much do I tell people that I work with or investigating about myself, um, and 
my friends about what I do. It was a, it was kind of this, this constant navigation that people really do have to do themselves here um, and have different experiences with. Mm-hmm. I was probably a little too uh, closed up. I think my, my wife would argue that I was the most discreet and that many other uh, colleagues were more forthcoming with their, their friends and family. And if I go back and do it again, I probably would be as well, um, you know, and all the things that I know now. And, um, but that's yeah. one of the reasons I wrote the book was to yeah. say, Hey guys, when you run away and do this, uh, this is something you're going to have to, to figure out what point do you tell your girlfriend? What point, what do you tell your, your friends? And uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you keep your story straight? Yeah, you were at one point, the, the bit that I loved is when you'd be out with your wife and people would say, what do you do? And you'd interject and say, she works at McDonald's and I work for the government. <laughs> and she had a corporate job at McDonald's and people were much more interested in asking her about McDonald's than you. They could care less because whatever, the government sounds boring. Oh, not yeah. everybody is fortunate enough to have such a great cover story. Yeah, which exactly. Which is their spouse exactly. works at McDonald's. I mean, exactly. you, you think about you're at a, a dinner party, how... Um, if you had the choices to talk about somebody's government job and corporate McDonald's, yeah, it went over just that right. well. I, I think given what I do, I'd probably question. want to know more about your government job, but I'm a little unusual, <laughs> maybe. Um, well, you, so you write in the book where you, you're, you're obviously you're starting out in Ottawa, and then you get transferred to Toronto, which is where you, you wanted to be. And your first one of your first big operations you write about is that you're uh, tasked with getting information that's coming out, if I have this right, from the American operations in the surge mm-hmm. in Iraq and leads that they're generating on Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, and connections that that might have to Canada. Um, Mm -hmm. And it made me think that that was an interesting place for you to talk a little bit about um, what is the relationship that CSIS has with its American partner? I mean, Canada is a member of the five eyes uh, of countries, uh, you know, the United States, UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. So you're all very close cousins, if you you like. So talk a little bit about that operation and then what that tells us about how CSIS interacts with the U.S. intelligence community uh, and the military. Yeah, it's a great, uh, great question. I'm sure uh, will be of interest to uh, your listeners here. So we are, you know, just by size and also the fact that we don't have a foreign intelligence service, we really are a net importer of American, of American British, uh, other organizations' information. We work very closely with the Five Eyes community and where they come across information on threats to Canada, they, they will share it. Uh, and we appreciate that greatly, you know, I, uh, sincerely. So that... That is the kind of relationship. It goes both ways. We obviously work very closely um, with the Americans and, and provide information that we have. But what was happening around that time? So I, I go to Toronto, and it's 2011, and the surge uh, has the surge has uh, happened, and they are kind of was it, clearing out intel, but really going through a lot of information that they had gathered and received in Iraq, and, and some of that information relates to Canada. Say so and so with a Canadian you know, number is associated with individuals involved in Al-Qaeda. Like sometimes it was very kind of loose and we select words pretty cautiously, right? So if you're saying associated with, a member of, known to, uh, involved with, like these are all you know words we put a lot of thought into. So you'd see um, is aware of, is... Um, associated with individuals who are known to engage in. And and then it was partial information, like a first name or a, a, a phone number with no name. And so we'd get these little bits and pieces of information that were of Canadians or, or Canadian information with this kind of uh, primer that they're, that information has been gathered here without much context. And I was go to tracking this stuff down. I had this this funny broken list of leads because you get that information, you get a phone number and, and it says phone number is uh, you know, the known contact of a member of, and you say, okay, well better figure out who that person is and what that contact is and whether that is that person or number uh, is going to be involved in threat related, you know, threat related activities as it relates to the CSIS act, right? Uh, Al Qaeda is a, a terrorist organization. And so, are they a member of Al Qaeda? Are they are they doing things here in Canada? But of course, we, I think we talked earlier about what are those conversations like. Well, um, those aren't always community leaders. Those are people who have popped up involved, and and not that they are 
bad or that we know they're up to no good or what those relationships are. Like a lot of time it was, what is this relationship? You know, like how did this person get associated with this phone number? Is this the same person who had this phone number two years ago when it was found? Uh, and I was just running around the community. Uh, so thank you to my American colleagues. Uh, you kept me gamefully employed and, and very busy uh, having having tea and cake with members of our uh, Iraq community here in Canada, trying to sort out, oh, who is this person? What are they up to? How do you think that they came to, to know, you know, who, who might they know back home? Do you think they're up to no good? Um, you know, what's going on here? And, and that's... This, this kind of funny, uh, funny part of that relationship, you know, we, we get sent a lot of stuff and then, mm-hmm. oh, if, if, it, if it comes up and they say, oh, this person is, then you go back to America and say, oh, you know what, this guy, you know, is doing this or might know this person and we can report back and, and uh, you know, see, see if there's more information to, to share, but all very controlled. And I don't want to you know, say this is going off uh, willy nilly. Like we, we have rules about how it's collected and what is shared, but you know, that's how it, it kind of works. And, and a couple, a couple of years of my life was really tracking down this information, which led to some pretty interesting um, cases and some, some pretty interesting investigations. Yeah. And I was going to ask, I mean, did the information that the Americans provided to the extent that you can talk about it, um, did it ever lead to you preventing some act of violence or, 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 uh, opening up a network that helped further understanding of terrorist plotting in Canada. Yeah, so I would say the um, the latter definitely led to some conversations that that um, resulted in better understanding of of networks of, of connective pieces and a more full account of kind of situations. I'd say what happened what ended up happening later. I think I mentioned this in the book, but. We had, um, I was in the process, I was going out and knocking on doors and talking to people. And, and part of that is that relationship building for that investigation, also just in general, right? Hey, uh, these are the things that I care about. These are the four threats that I investigate. I you know, work with your community. If something comes up, please let me know. And I say a couple of years later, so 2011, we're worried about bombs going off. You think about it in, in Toronto, we had the Toronto 18 in 2006, mm. a via rail plot, some other plots domestically. But later on, it moved to the foreign fighters problem. People rushing off and, and joining uh, ISIS and wanting to go and get involved in uh, activities overseas. And I think I mentioned in the book, you know, a couple of years down the road, uh, somebody that was door I had knocked on that uh, my colleagues had knocked on called up and said, hey, you know, I, I think I have some information about people who are interested in going overseas and might get themselves into trouble. So we said, oh, okay, like, you know, let's, uh, let's have that conversation and see if we can, uh, what we can find out and what we can do there. So yeah, those, that, uh, those leads led to uh, relationships, lead to um, those kind of relationships of trust and uh, understanding what's happening at home and, and abroad. Uh, absolutely. Because you never know where those are going to go. It's, it's one of those, they might have developed further since I left. I was only on that desk for, for a short period of time. Mm. So I, I'd say uh, thanks, and I hope, I hope we returned, uh, returned the favor. So later in your career, and this is sort of where the book <clears throat> starts to come to its conclusion, is you go into special operations. And this, this is the stuff that I think probably looks the most like what people <laughs> would be familiar in seeing in a movie, where we're talking about – you know, uh, covert operations that are designed to, you know, search someone's car or maybe their their, their residence and, and to not to, to do to do it without them knowing. So tell us a little bit about how you got into that and give us a flavor of of the kind of work that you did when you were going into special operations. Yeah. So if a subject investigation reaches a kind of threat threshold and we feel like we need more intrusive powers uh, to investigate the individual, to read emails, intercept um, phone calls, uh, to record them in areas where they would otherwise have the expectation of privacy. We can apply to a judge and get a warrant, which provides, gives you access to that information. Now, you can't just walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know, judge says I'm allowed to read your emails because we believe you're emailing threat related information back and forth, hand them over. You'd want to do that covertly uh, to maintain the integrity of the investigation. So we would call up our special operations team, which is a, a 
specialized unit at CSIS, and they would develop a plan to get access to that email. Sometimes it was pretty straightforward, serving a warrant to a, a telecoms provider, um, but sometimes that involved the planting of what we call technical surveillance equipment, you know, microphones, um, bugs, and other recording devices, places where that person might be having those conversations or engaged in those activities. And I, that, that is the, 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 maybe a little more of the movie stuff where you see, and go, oh, that's what I envision, um, kind of spy, spy life. And I thought, oh, that looks, that looks pretty cool. Uh, I'd like to do that. And they, it is a team made up of, there are technologists, there's the close access technologists who can um, drill into your wall, plant a camera, reseal your wall, and you, you never knew that it was there, you never find it. And there's the remote access guys who can hack into technology that is in place and, and get access remotely. And then there's the intelligence officers, our, our uh, people like me, um, who kind of draft the plan, work with the desks, and do procurement for the technologists uh, and the techs, make sure they have what they need to to carry out their missions. So we sit down and um, have a big conversation and say, well, this person is uh, having conversations in their car, can't get access to their phones. Maybe we want to track where their car goes or listen to what's happening in their car, those types of things. And we would come up with a plan to put some technical surveillance equipment and figure out what that would look like. And so that involved a lot of, yeah, that was that was kind of the late nights, uh, close calls, uh, as part of uh, as part of the book, it's something that, as I said, it was it was um, very fun, stressful. There's a lot of prep that goes into those, sometimes very very short operations, that will take days and weeks and, and a lot of planning to 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 carry out things that you see um, when I, I was writing I was writing the book and I was concerned like how much how much can I give away you know what can I say what can I not say I'd like mm-hmm. to give people. Not not a not a how to book of of what it's uh, you know how to do these things, but what it's like to do them, right? Like what it's like when you stand beside a car and the, and the alarm goes off and you're standing there <laughs> trying to break into it, and uh, it, it it is a surreal you know, feeling doing these things. And I spent a lot of that part of my career going, I can't believe I get to do this. I can't believe mm-hmm. I have to do this. If I was to do this in as a civilian, it would be illegal and kind of a fun, stressful and, and surreal experience. So that's what I kind of wanted to, to capture and talk and, and talk a little bit about it. Um, yeah, I spent a, a few years there when I was a, a field investigator, as we spoke about knocking on doors, you know, I, I got, I got married. I was, I was dating for a while and I got I'm married, talked about this in the book. And I would, I told my then girlfriend, now wife. And I said, you know, I, I'm an intelligence officer and I meet with people. So, Sometimes those people don't want to meet during the day, right? And I, I go out at eight o'clock at night or seven o'clock at night for a coffee. Um, you know, they want to wait, put the kids to bed, and then and then come out and, and, and meet with me. And she really understood that. And then I moved to special operations. Said, you know, honey, now I work from eleven p.m. to four a.m. She said, who <laughs> are you shift. meeting with? <laughs> yeah, who are you meeting with at two in the morning? I said, well, you know, now I work when I don't want to see anybody. And uh-huh. we are going places where we are trying not to run into people, and, and that's the best time to do it. So you can imagine it's 11 o'clock at night. I say goodnight to my wife and my you know, little baby at the time. And I say, I can't tell you where I'm going. I can't tell you what I'm doing. I can't tell you who I'm going to be with. Uh, I think I'll be home at 3. I'm not 100% sure. And love you and, and see you in a bit. Have a nice day at work, honey. Yeah, we'll see. I'll see you at See you at 4 a.m. Try not to wake you up when I come home, <laughs> right? Um, Probably some sleepless nights for her too. Yeah, not not great for her. And she, as I said, I, I when I wrote when I wrote the book, I had said to my publisher a couple times, like, you know, I I love my wife. She's incredibly understanding, right? That comes across. That comes across in the book. I never <laughs> wanted her to come across as the wet blanket, as the person who, like, she said, I can't. She never, ever, ever, ever said, um, you know, I can't can't do this or it's too stressful. Now, there were some moments where I could see that she was upset. I talked about those in the book. You know, I, I got a few teary, uh, you know, teary voicemail messages at, at 4.30 or 5 in the morning when her phone calls are, when she woke up at 5 and I'm not there. She goes to call me and it goes right to voicemail because I'm stuck in a, in a you know, stairwell in, a, in a, an apartment building. Um, you know, that she never said, you have to leave. I just, 
think and it's human to not want to hurt the people that you love or that are close to you. Um, but, but that is, yeah, that was this stressful, uh, stressful part of the job uh, for her and, and for me, mostly, mostly for her. Uh, those times. So that actually gets to, to your decision ultimately to, to leave the service, and 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 you know you, you did not opt to spend your entire career there. So tell us about your decision to part ways with CSIS. Why did you Why did you do that? Yeah, ultimately, I, I obviously did. Uh, I, I did leave, um, and there were a lot of reasons. I, I did not. You know, I did leave on a point of principle. There was not a case that that I thought we were. Um, screwing up. It's just my life situation changed. I try to articulate that in the book. I, I signed up. I was 25. The, I was inspired by the events going on in the world. I was single. They told me, you got to go live in, in, in rural wherever and, and work in a windowless office for two years. I, I said, sure, no problem. Absolutely. You know, I, I and then my life situation changed. Uh, the, the personal calculations changed. I got married, I had a baby, um, young family, and the, the I started. Uh, and I'd say, "Hey, we have a new case, and you're going to have to break into this place." Rather than being, "Oh, cool, that sounds really cool and exciting," which I, I totally would have done earlier in my career, I thought, "Oh, I'm going to be so tired," hmm. you know, like I <laughs> I got to do three nights of prep work and. Um, yeah, when you start going that way, I thought, okay, maybe it's time to go. Now, CSIS offers, offers the opportunity where you can, I could go back and get a desk job. I, I'm not saying that they, you know, they, they wouldn't have accommodated. I said, ah, you know what? I want to go back and, and work in, the, in, in an office and do a nine to five. Lots of people do. You have the opportunity to do that. But I, I, I looked at it more as I served. I did 10 years, almost 10 years. I, I kind of didn't get everything out of the experience that I wanted to Obviously, you can't do anything, but I had a good run. I was I was proud to have worked there. I was proud of the work that I did, and I had a positive experience. I, I would not complain about the desk that I got or the, the files that I was asked to work. But it was just time to do something different. And in, in Canada, it's funny. I um, talked to people from other intelligence services, and we have uh, a nice pension plan here. And if you work 30 years and you can retire at a reasonable age, you're, you're well taken care of. And some other government services where they don't have as, as a good a pension plan, some people leave a little earlier to go make some money in, in, the, in the private space. I was going to hit a time a few years back where, where it would have been silly to leave. You know, there's, there is a, a golden handcuff or it's a, it's a nice job. They pay you well. They take care of you when you retire. Um, that at some point that gets tough to leave. And I was probably before that and a, knew that there was going to be a transition, whatever I did. And I'd rather do that when I was, I had some more runway left, um, to, to, to figure out the next the steps of my life. You know, what do, what do X spies kind of do? I, I didn't have a, a great answer for that question, but I, I felt like I needed to be out to figure it out. It, it felt weird to me to send a CV with my name on it and CSIS, uh, as, as work experience to people in an email, you know, that didn't, uh, I said, I'm going to go look for, for jobs or I'm going to go do right. something else. I'd like to be able to be honest about where I worked, and I don't know if I can do that 100% while I'm still there. Not to, not to, I know people do. Um, I just, I, I think I needed to make a, a clean break of it. What do you do now? So I, I consult now, uh, which is I, I joke that I used to uh, break into places, and now I help keep people out. We do. Uh, <laughs> Threat risk assessment, security surveys, some, some private investigations, and, do, and due diligence. So all the kind of skills and experience that I acquired in my time at CSIS, I, I help uh, with, the, with the team here, companies set understand their threats and risks, so they can build a security program that's appropriate for you know the challenges they face and, and their vulnerabilities. Um, and it's yeah, it's it's fun being on the other side of it. Um, it's, it's different being in private security versus versus government. Can you kind of tell your clients do, to say like, this is how we would have broken into your, 100%, your car? I, I'd say <laughs> you are a hundred percent. And, and for people too, right. You know, we, we talked a little bit about in special, in special operations, we talked about um, the close access team, the road access team. Well, when I was there, you better believe that there was a real transition from close access to remote. Why are we going to get a team of 10 people into an office after hours where there is a very real chance of getting caught and 
the, the challenge of plausible deniability if I'm holding a piece of this person's wall in my hands uh, when they when they stumble upon me versus, oh, they they already have a, they already have a camera in their building. Maybe I can just hack into that and we can you know, use that. So there is um, there is this uh, this move to remote that's creating vulnerabilities, to people that, that we need to understand. And, and the same goes for um, knocking on doors. You know, when I used to knock on a door. I would try to find out as much information I could about the person that I was going to talk to. And back 10 years ago, if you Googled somebody, their name, maybe they were in an article in the local paper, but they volunteered somewhere. If you were lucky, they were, you could find it maybe as a member of like a Rotary Club and, and, and try to find some civic engagement. Well, now you have everybody's network is on Facebook. Everything they've ever thought of in their life is on Twitter and a con, you know, stream of consciousness. You can see oh, this person may be receptive to talking to me because these are all the tweets where they're, you know, hate so-and-so and so-and-so. And And this person is close with my person of interest because they're friends on Facebook and they're liking each other's, um, you know, liking each other's uh, photos and things like that, right? You can, so conversely, when I talk to companies and private individuals and say, these are the things I can find out about you. This is if I was to try to get you remotely or uh, close. This, these are the things that I would be looking for. And these are where you are vulnerable. I can see everyone you're connected to. I could see who you are likely to accept an email from to be a target of phishing. Right. I could see what I would want to put in that email to get you to click that link. Mm-hmm. Or I could find the badge from your company online and be able to recreate it and walk into your office, you know, for an office building. Um, you know, those physical and, you know, bug, bug sweeps too. We do, we do technical surveillance countermeasures, which is, um, this is where you having your sensitive conversations for your AGM, for your, um, you know, complex uh, litigation, contentious litigation. Well, let's go and make sure that room is secure and has audio and visual integrity so that nobody is recording you for nefarious purposes, you know, because this is what we would do if uh, if we were trying to get you. Do any of your former CSIS colleagues contact you and say, you know, hey, Andrew, you know, stop stop giving away the, the, the techniques here. <laughs> you're, making it, you're making it harder for us. No, I, it's not really about, I say, techniques. There are security principles uh, that really are accessible to everybody. I, I, I don't think there's any... The secret sauce they have is probably their access. Um, the fact that they can apply for warrant powers, we're very limited private in the private security space, which, which you're able uh, to do investigatively. Um, but I'm in the business of keeping people safe, and so are they. So if anything, they want companies and individuals and Canadians to be more secure. It's in all of our interest, especially where, where regards to kind of cyber and information security. Um, there we are. We are very, very much aligned, trying to raise awareness mm. that there are people out to get us. Canadians, Americans, you don't have this problem as much, uh, I don't think. But we are a little more naive, a little more complacent, and have this this no, who 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 wants me? Who could be interested in me? Who could you know? Who cares? And um, and, and there's an education piece to it. Say no, there are absolutely uh, people out to get you. You have things of value, whether it's personal things of value, like your your, your credit card and banking and, and money, or credentials that provide access to your company, that provide access to people around you. Um, and we need to all work together to limit those uh, vulnerabilities to keep everyone safe. Uh, and so they're very much supportive of, of, of that message, um, whether or not they'll... they'll uh, uh, say that I, I, I think that we're um, you know, aligned as far as what we're trying to do, which is to keep you know keep people safe, keep Canadians safe, uh, keep everyone safe. Yeah. So so you leave the the service and you decide you're going to write this memoir. Now in the United States, when former intelligence officers write about their time in government, if you're at the CIA, for instance, it goes the manuscript is submitted to a publication review board. They look at it. They ensure there's nothing classified in it or problematic. Maybe they make some suggested edits that you might be required to make. How did this work? Because for you, because nobody uh, from your service had written a memoir. So what was it like <laughs> when you go back to your agency and say, "Hey, I want to write a book about what it was like to work here"? I joke that you know, in sports where they have those 
those kind of injuries that are named after the players, the Tommy John or, or laws are named after people. <laughs> right, there may Steve be Steve Sachs um, syndrome or whatever. Yeah, yeah. there there or there may be a you know an Andrew Kirsch law because I don't think they were they were uh, or knew 100 percent what to what to do with me. I this book, as I said, I had a positive experience. I think it's an important uh, that's doing important work. It's not a policy book. It's not a finger pointing. You know, we miss this, we miss that. It is. Um, just my personal experience, obviously. So I, I wanted to sensitize it to him. I, I want to be on site. I didn't want to go to jail. I, I joke with my publisher. I said it'll be a two book deal, and the second one's from prison. And everyone <laughs> found that funny, except for my wife. So I, I, I wanted to work with them, but it was a challenge. We don't have the systems that you have in place there, where there is a, a place to send it, like an actual place in a review body to send it. And so you know, I had to kind of navigate that space because our laws are very broad here. It had not really been challenged. You know, there was no, there was no precedent for it on their side. And they're, they're feeling, you know, my, I said, look, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to make a how-to book and I don't want to rely. I'm not here to, um, to put anyone in a tough spot. And I am bound by our security of information act uh, security information laws that I take very seriously, right? I my friends are still there. I don't want to jeopardize any investigations. And and most of this stuff is public. I mean, you watch these movies, some of them are getting, you talk about me giving away uh, things, the things you see in the movies about how people are operating are, 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 are wild and much more involved than, than anything I would have given away. And their you know, concern, obviously, is that if it comes from somebody who worked at that organization, that is a different level than just seeing it in a, in a movie written as part of the fiction. So we had to kind of kind of navigate that, and I, I hope going forward, I say I've, I've, I've walked so others could run, or I've had the stressful experience, so others will have less on both sides. That there will be a way for more people to tell their stories because I think it's important. Uh, I'm not in jail. I, I joke about that in the book. Um, I, I think at one point uh, someone told me that if um, if I had been a whistleblower, I would have had more protection. Like if I had actually mm. pointed out illegal things happened. And I could have done that under kind of whistleblower protection laws. But because I said, no, I, I didn't break the law, um, I was more vulnerable to issues. But, you know, I think they, they have, the organization has remained silent. Um, you know, they're not going to come out and say, we support or we stamp or, or we approve. Um, Did they read the manuscript before you published it? Yeah, they, um, I, I sent it in. I, okay. I sent it in. I said, look, I'm, I'm running a book. And, you know, if I, I think if I'd said to them, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a book. They would have said, well, you can't or mm. no. So what I did is I wrote the book and I said, this is the book. My book isn't to talk anybody into or out of working at that work in there. Uh, it's just, no, I mean, it's well, a very, it's, like, it's, an, yeah. it's, I would even call it a flattering portrayal of the agency. Yeah. So uh, that was my, yeah, my, my hope was that uh, they would be receptive and, and they were. And no, and no, but nobody said you got to take this part out or yeah, this is fine. But like that chapter's got to go. We had some back and forth. Uh, okay. I wish it was a more straightforward process. It wasn't. I think we got to, you know, there, there will be maybe going forward, but it wasn't. And that was a challenge. And that's obviously yeah. maybe why there hasn't been one in the, in the past. What does it say about Canadians that nobody ever tried this? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, you know, it's like, I mean, it's like, it is a cottage industry for XCA officers to write I, well, that, memoirs. That my, Many of them are not feeling. very good. <laughs> well, my feeling was, look, we got a CIA book every week. I mean, really, uh, a lot of varying quality, but that's great. Uh, you know, I, if the next person writes a fantastic book, I will, I will feel a great sense of pride that maybe, in some small way, I gave that person some, you know, uh, some confidence that, that, that they could do that. We're we're a young organization. I don't we don't have the, the history of it. Once that dam breaks, maybe there will be uh, there will be more. There is the organization very much is a um, you know, be discreet and. Spies should be you know, not not seen or heard, and I and I get that too. And, and I don't know, you, you've written a book too. How'd you feel the couple weeks before the book came out? You know, it's uh, oh, pretty nervous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who am I to write this? What do I know? You know, I was writing a memoir. What do I know about this subject? I'm like, it was my well, life. Usually, it was your um, life. So yeah, yeah, that's but that's what I'm saying. So you know, you go through all those emotions. It, it's tough. It's stressful, um, and. I think that's a barrier to it as well. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to write, and it uh, it can be an emotional experience. Right. 
Um, well, it's our tradition here on Chatter for the for the final question that we ask our guests. I actually reach into what we have here is an actual box, which you can't see it because okay. we're, we're talking uh, just over audio here called the Chatter Box, where I'm going to select <laughs> one of a number of pre-written questions at random uh, to ask you for our uh, final question. So here we go. Uh, this is a good one. Recommend any recent book you've read, podcast you've listened to, or TV show you've watched. It doesn't have to be related to espionage, but if it is, that that's great. But is there is there something that you've read uh, or are listening to right now that's uh, really kind of like got you on fire? Oh, uh, I'm into the the sports and and uh, chat uh, a smart list podcast and the Conan oh, that's a good a friend one. podcast. Just kind of the uh, you know, turn the brain off. I, there are uh, not, not that they're not informative. Um, the David Spade and and uh, Dana Carvey podcast I enjoy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just I like a, kind of a light. Uh, let's laugh. I had a lot of friends who listened to the Spy podcast and how to how to uh, how they build it and, and those types and I and books. I kind of like to maybe just kind of turn it off a little bit. Right. Yeah. Watched, yeah. So you, you you tend towards it when it's entertainment. You don't want to be reminded of work. No, I I, I can't watch I can't watch my movies. Maybe this is I shouldn't say I, I don't enjoy the, the James Bond movie. The, the recent ones I, I oh, don't understand. I don't understand them. I don't really understand what's happening. Um, <laughs> I had that um, problem in the last one. To be honest, yeah, I'm not sure the scriptwriters knew what was happening either in the last but, one. But yeah, that's I don't quite know what's going on. I find them a little dark, tough to follow, um, and I just. I much preferred Melissa McCarthy's movie Spy. I thought yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, you mentioned the book. Great movie. Great movie. Uh, my my experience is at CSIS, it's a it's a workplace comedy where people who are their hearts in the right place, they signed up to 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 to, to do what they could to serve to make the world a better place, and are trying to figure it out and, and are in, in weird situations and and a, a lot of laughing uh, and a lot of filling. Kind of filling the gaps while you're sitting in the back of the van, just just chatting and and, and joking and trying to to bust each other's chops. Yeah. So I, that that tends to be, I guess, the the podcast and the entertainment I gravitate towards is a couple people in a room sitting, laughing, uh, busting each other up, and trying to uh, yeah, just trying to make each other laugh. Because I said when I was dealing with those stressful situations, that's that's what I was trying to do. Yeah. Well, it comes across. The book is it's a really entertaining read. There's a lot of levity in it. Um, there's a lot of humanity in it, which is great. So so congratulations. As, as a primer also for people who want to work for CSIS, you should read this book. If you're in Canada, yes. don't bother with the Google search. Uh, get Andrew <laughs> Kirsch's book. The title again is I Was Never Here, My True Canadian Spy Story of Coffees, Codenames and Covert Operations in the Age of Terrorism. Uh, Andrew Kirsch, thanks for coming on the podcast and talking about it. This has been a lot of fun. It's been great, great to chat. I really appreciate uh, the invitation and, and happy to be here. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. 